any prey animal that could tell when a predator was looking at it would escape better than one that couldn't. This is the most immediate way in which we can think about consciousness being beyond the brain. If you take the normal view of vision, the standard view you're taught in school, um, what happens when you see me is that light moves from me through the electromagnetic field, enters your eyes, inverted images on the retinas, changes in the optic co in, in the cone cells, in the optic nerve, and in various regions of the brain, including the visual cortex. And then somehow, no one knows how, you form a conscious image of me standing here. Now, the first bit, the description of what happens in the eyes and the brain, has all been described in more detail than ever before, thanks to brain scans and so forth. So we know an awful lot about that, but we know very, very little about how you actually produce images and where they are. And as I say, the standard view is they must be somewhere inside the head as a kind of controlled hallucination. Some philosophers have begun to say, well, no, they needn't all be inside the head. Um, in a very uncontroversial way, uh, some have pointed out that our minds extend into the world around us. For example, a blind person with a stick, as they feel the ground around them, the stick becomes part of their sense of who they are and where they are. Um, some people, like David Chalmers, the philosopher, argue that uh, uh, we've outsourced a lot of our mind into mobile phones and into biotechnologies, that our minds uh, have this kind of external to the brain dimension anyway through technology. And you could argue that the whole of culture as a product of mind uh, is, is sort of products of mind beyond the brain. This tent, Kenwood House, roads, cars, all these things are produced by minds and imagined by minds in the first place and then made real through technology and culture. Um, but what I'm saying is going beyond that. What I'm suggesting is that uh, the old view that when we see something, light comes into the eyes, changes happen in the head, and we then project out the images, this very old view might be closer to reality than we usually think. This is the view of vision that's held by traditional people all over the world, and it's believed in by children in the West. Until they're 10 or 11, they take it for granted that something goes out of the eyes when you see you're projecting something out. Um, it's called extramission, sending out. Um, and Jean Piaget, the developmental biologist or psychologist, uh, found that European children until the age of about 10 or 11 take it for granted that vision involves an outward projection of images. He said after that, they learned the correct view, which is that thoughts and images are invisible things located inside the head. Um, however, not everyone learns it, and a recent series of papers from Ohio State University by some psychologists uh, showed that when they surveyed their own psychology undergraduates, they found the majority of them actually believed in extramission, that their images were outside their brains. They were appalled by this discovery, and so they put them through a re-education program where they forcefully asserted nothing leaves the eyes when you see something and repeat after me. And they repeated it after them. And when they tested them immediately after this intensive drilling into the correct view, uh, they got the right answer. But they tested them again after several months and found that most had reverted to their previous opinion. And they were appalled at the, the way in which people and perfectly normal educated people could fall victim to superstitious theories of vision uh, and proved immune to proper scientific education. Well, what I'm suggesting is that actually this view may be correct. We may be projecting out what we see, and oddly enough, uh, as well as being taught that vision only involves intromission, the incoming uh, in movement of light, we're also taught at school the extramission theory, but in uh, we're taught that in physics classes when dealing with optics and the nature of mirrors. And in optics classes, we're effectively taught the theory of mirror images that was put forward by Euclid around 300 BC, the first person to figure out clearly what happens with mirrors. And what Euclid shows is, or argued was that when you look at something in a mirror, the light is bent, the angle of incidence equals the light of reflection for a plane mirror, but when you look at it, um, you project out the images 
and those go straight through the mirror. And in physics textbooks, there's a little dotted line going behind the mirror, projected behind the mirror, uh, to create a virtual image behind the mirror. And they're called virtual images because they're produced by your mind. And the little dotted lines show the projection process. This is straight Euclid, extramission theory, uh, which everyone's taught as well as the intromission theory. So everyone's taught it's only we're like coming in, nothing goes out. But in physics, they're taught, well, there's uh, mirror images. The reason you see the images behind the mirror is because you're projecting them out there. And actually, every time you look at something in a mirror, you're seeing your projections. Now, of course, uh, some people would argue, well, this is a kind of illusion. They're not really out there. It just looks as if they're out there and so on. Um, so you can argue backwards and forwards about all this. But I'm an experimental scientist. And so my approach is to see, well, how could you actually test it? If when you look at something, your mind reaches out and you, in a sense, touch it, could you affect what you look at just by looking at it? Well, put it differently, if you look at another person from behind and they don't know you're there, could you affect them by looking at them? Might they feel your looks and turn round and look back at you? Or um, have you ever experienced sitting somewhere and just turning around and finding someone looking at you? Well, 95% of the population have had that experience, the sense of being stared at, or scoposthesia as it's now called scientifically. Those of us who started researching this in the 1980s ran into the problem that some scientists said this can't be a proper phenomenon, a scientific phenomenon, because it hasn't got a scientific name. Um, and one critic, uh, Dr. Carpenter at Cambridge, uh, was scathing about the whole line of research that I and others were conducting into the sense of being stared at. But he said, uh, he said if it did have, if it did exist, then a good scientific name for it would be scoposthesia. Scop as in microscope, seeing, asthesia as in anesthesia, synesthesia, feeling, feeling looks. And so that's now become the name. So it's now, it's a proper scientific phenomenon, it's called scoposthesia. And there have now been a, a lot of research on this. First of all, the natural history. Um, interviewing people and collecting stories, I have well over a thousand stories from people about being looked at. What becomes clear from those stories is that in real life, it's directional. It's not just people feeling a vague sense of unease and then they look around to see if someone's looking at them. They usually swivel around and look straight at the person looking at them. And this is clearest when people are looking from upstairs windows because they not only turn around, but they look up. Um, and this is a repeatable fact and it's directional. It's directional with animals too. Animals have this as well. Dogs and cats will turn around and look and people will turn around and look at an animal that's staring at them. Uh, one Australian woman, for, for example, told me that she was very keen on koala bears and liked photographing them. But when she went out into the forest, she couldn't see them very easily because they were sort of camouflaged. So she found that her best way of doing it was to just stand there doing nothing in particular. Then she suddenly feel one staring at her. She'd turn around and there it would be. <laughs> so. Um, this happens with animals too. So it's very widespread, it's biological, it's not specifically human. I then interviewed security guards and surveillance personnel who spend their whole life looking at people. Um, most of us are mere amateurs. Um, uh, but uh, for example, private detectives, when they're shadowing people, uh, they, when they're taught how to do it, they're taught not to stare at the back of their neck because their personal feel it turn around and their cover's blown. Rather, they look at them only occasionally. They have to look at them a bit, of course, um, uh, but they look at their feet. So this is completely well known among practical people. In the British SAS, when people are being trained how to creep up behind someone to stab them in the back, uh, they're told don't stare at their back because they're likely to feel you turn around and shoot you first. In the martial arts, they have training programs so you can train yourself to be more sensitive at being looked at from behind is completely taken for granted by most people, especially practical people in the security and military world. I myself think that this ability first evolved in nature in the context of predator-prey relations because any prey animal that could tell when a predator was looking at it would escape better than one that couldn't. Well, there have now been a great many experiments conducted on this the simplest experiments involve uh, 
people being looked at from behind, blind, blindfolded people looked at in a randomized series of trials, looking or not looking, and they guess if they're being looked at or not. And by chance, they'd be right 50% of the time. These trials have shown, and hundreds of thousands of trials now have been done, have shown a very consistent positive effect. It's not a very strong effect, it's about 55% correct compared with 50% by chance. Uh, but it's massively significant with such large numbers. It's been done in the Amsterdam Science Museum for 25 years, for example, the NEMO Center in Amsterdam, uh, with huge numbers of people doing it and enormously significant responses. What they found was the most sensitive subjects were children under the age of nine. I've also found that. So um, there's now a lot of evidence for this um, from experimental tests. It even works when people are looked at through windows, through one-way mirrors, and so on. It turns out that sleeping animals and people can be woken by staring at them. And one of my projects at the moment, which any of you could take part in if you've got a dog or a cat and a mobile phone, uh, is to stare at it when it's asleep and see if it wakes up at randomized staring times. The slogan for this research is, don't let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> uh, um, and I've also recently developed an app. Uh, it was only in the last week it's become uh, almost fully functional. The beta version is a sort of like beta plus version at the moment, which I invite you to try out. If you go to my website, childrake.org, uh, there's a, in the menu bar, it says take part, and the top item there is called staring app. It works on mobile phones. You work with a partner. Uh, basically, it tells one person when to look at the back of the other, and they can say if they're being looked at or not by saying yes or no. It keeps the score. And the point of it is to see if you can get better at it with practice. Um, and what I'm trying to find out is how to train yourself to be more sensitive under these rather artificial conditions. Some people are better at this than others, and I'm, I know from research that's been carried out in a university in London that people can actually improve with training doing this kind of test. So if you're motivated to do this, do please have a go. And if you can get better at it, please email me. I, I give the details with the app um, and let me know how you got on and how you've done it. Uh, because I'm really keen to find out how to get better at it. Uh, because if it can be trained, uh, it, it'll be clearer that it's real. Um, I'm convinced it's a real phenomenon. Most people are, but there are still skeptics who say, no, it's impossible. It can't possibly happen. So it's an ongoing debate. But if lots of people get really good at it, then it makes it easier for research. Now, I think, in other words, that our minds reach out into the world around us through attention and intention. And the very words indicate that. The Latin word ad tendere means to stretch towards, and in tendere means to stretch into. So I think our minds literally stretch out into the world around us through our attentions and intentions, and that these can have effects on what we look at. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.